this administration is running like a fine-tuned machine. Oh my God, they've got a madman on their hands. Podcasting from a secret location, deep inside the political colossus, this is Radio Free GOP, the voice of the Republican resistance. What did the president know, and when did he know it? We will have no truth or folly with you, or the grisly gang who work your wicked will. You do your worst, and we will do our best. <laughs> at Radio Free America. This is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. We're going to hold on to him by the nose, and we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time, and we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. This is Radio Free GOP with your host, Mike Murphy. Hello there, Radio Free GOP listeners. It's me, Mike Murphy. Thank you for tuning in. This is, well, I think the truth in advertising police will insist that I be honest here. This is a bait and switch special episode of Radio Free GOP. In other words, I don't really have a new Radio Free GOP for you. I may have some in the future. But in the meantime, I wanted to call your attention to the new podcast I'm doing, Hacks on Tap, with my old friend David Axelrod. Max and I have been friends for decades. We used to run campaigns against each other, and we maintained a great friendship all the way through it. For years, we've been talking on the phone about politics based on our joint experiences, and we thought having you all listen in on the conversation might be a lot of fun, might give you a little more insight than the noise you hear a lot in the media from people who kind of dress up and play campaign consultant but haven't really done it. So, a couple of gray beards talking politics. What could be more interesting? I hope you'll check it out, and to make that easy, right now I'm going to play you the entire latest hacks on tap we recorded this thing just a few hours ago in the middle of the night right after the second of the big democratic debates so this is kind of a mini episode but it gives you our view of what happened who did well who didn't and what it means you can check out the full hacks on tap catalog on stitcher radio.com and of course itunes spotify all your podcast platforms give it a listen i think you may like it well thank you very much and without any further ado here's hacks on tap radio Free GOP! Hey, pull up a chair. It's Hacks on Tap with David Axelrod and Mike Murphy. Murphy, it's uh, 1.30 in the morning in the east. I am overstimulated. I can't sleep. Uh, Two nights, four hours of... 20 candidates of Democratic <laughs> debates, and I'm mulling over in my own mind what it all means. Uh, and uh, you, you give me your headlines, I'll give you mine. Okay. Well, I think the one people are going to be sleeping even less than you are the Biden campaign because this was the classic bad night. He had to be in command. Uh, he didn't have to dominate totally, but he had to be in command. And instead, Kamala Harris did well, hijacked the debate, became the star. And he looked old. So the stakes for the next debate for Biden are as high as they could possibly be. Because if he can't dominate and take that position back next time, you only, I think, get one more shot before it starts to unravel. She had a great night. He had a really, it wasn't a disaster, but it was weak. And he is losing the grip he had as the winner, the machine, the risk-free candidate. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think his whole deal is predicated on that. He's the guy who can take out Donald Trump. He is the, 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 the trusty, reliable, uh, unrisky, uh, familiar face. Uh, but there's always been this question, which is, he's 76 years old. Uh, he's been out of the game for a bit. Uh, his, he, 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 the, the flip side of restoration is backward looking. Uh, right. And what he needed tonight was to be energetic, vigorous, forward looking. Uh, didn't happen. And... The one exchange that I think people will most remember was the one between Biden and Kamala Harris uh, about his 
comments at a fundraiser recently in which he talked about how he had worked uh, collegially with a couple of notorious segregationists in the U.S. Senate. Uh, let, let's listen to first uh, Senator Harris, and then let's listen to the vice president. We have also heard, and I'm going to now direct this at Vice President Biden. Um, I do not believe you are a racist. And I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. But I also believe, and it is personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful, to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And, you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. It's a mischaracterization of my position across the board. I did not praise racist. That is not true, number one. Number two, if we want to have this campaign litigated on who supports civil rights and whether I did or not, I'm happy to do that. I'm the guy that extended the Voting Rights Act for 25 years. We got to the place where we got 98 out of 98 votes in the United States Senate doing it. I've also argued very strongly that we, in fact, deal with the notion of denying people access to the ballot box. I agree that everybody, once they, in fact, they should, anyway, my time's up, I'm sorry. Community. But they, uh, Vice President Biden, do you agree today, do you agree today that you were wrong to oppose busing in America then? No, do you agree? I did not oppose busing in America. What I opposed is busing ordered by the Department of Education. That's what I opposed. So the whole scene uh, played badly for Biden, I thought. Uh, first of all, uh, the way she posited the question in very personal terms about her own experience was really powerful. And by the way, any exchange that begins with, I don't think you're a racist, but never ends very well, just as a matter of course. But, uh, yeah, she, and then, and then uh, his, you know, his defense about his position on busing uh, in the 70s, on which he worked with uh, Senator Eastland, one of the segregationists, um, was uh, was kind of appalling. It, it, he invoked essentially a states' rights argument uh, there. So you know, it, it was it, it hurt him in a lot of different ways. He didn't look very good. He didn't look very much in control. Uh, he invoked uh, an argument that is uh, uh, a appalling argument for and a uh, you know offensive argument to many Americans, particularly Americans of color, but not limited. Uh, to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, it was a very, very bad moment for him and a very strong moment for her. Yeah, it was sort of a multidimensional fail. When she started up, it might have been too much for somebody who's so beloved within the Democratic Party, having been in the good fight for so long. But he wound up hurting himself more, I think, than she hurt him. One, this was the most obvious thing that was certainly going to be coming. We're already mm -hmm. getting the staff leaks about the brilliant staff had prepped him and it's all his fault, which is such a bad sign about their culture. But he should have been before. ready with something mm -hmm. here. In, instead, not only did he not really have an answer and he went to process, he wound up on the, the basically the argument that segregationists made. He tried to do it as a fact check. Well, I was actually voting for states' rights. You're mischaracterizing. But that's the worst life you know, raft in the world to go to, particularly now. It's his core problem of having a record about yesterday and being judged about the stuff today. And then that horrible metaphor, the media, of course, can't resist uh, when he, you know, kind of ran out of gas and my my time is up. So yeah. on, on every level, he took a, a situation he should have been ready for and made it a lot worse by such a weak response, which, of course, elevates her. You know, she had the fastball and the mighty Casey. He struck out. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I have no doubt that they worked on this for hours and hours yep. and hours, and he had a response for it. But she came at him in a way I don't think he expected, and he had to, uh, he had to you know, act on his feet. And he didn't show the agility 
that was necessary here, which I think raises, you know, it exacerbates the questions people already had, which is, uh, is his time up? And, you know, he can recover from this, uh, but, uh, but now the stakes are even higher. There's blood in the water, beyond which, you know, right now he is polling at 60% among African Americans in uh, the country as a whole. She is at 12%. Uh, but exchanges like this should, they, uh, and this will go viral, uh, and especially yep. if they're compounded, uh, are going to change that equation, and that's going to chip away at a bulwark at a at a a great asset that is keeping him at the top of the heap here no she got him right in the kneecaps of his political support in the polling so the question is he's got that reservoir of goodwill with african americans He, he has been in the fight so long for good things but she she went right at him and he just didn't handle it well which makes it worse so i i couldn't agree more about the next debate he's either got to get in control and magnificently approve, or he's gonna he's gonna start sliding fast. And what I'll be watching for going forward, one of course how he handles this, but also, well, wait a second, well, how a would good... you handle it if you were if you were him? What would you if you were his campaign? What would you be doing right now? I've been thinking about this, and I, I I'm not yeah. quite sure. Well, it's a tough one because you're you're litigating the past, but I I, I would have advised him to. First, in, in something where it's a frontal attack like that, say, well, I'm hurt too be, because I got into this as a young public defender, and he did a little of this, uh, the fight for civil rights. It's my whole career. And at a time when there were segregationists in the Senate, let me tell you how I beat them. I smiled at them, reached around behind, and rolled them in the well, gutter. That's what and we he won. should have done, we but that's not what he did again. do. But what does he right. do now? I mean, what does he do uh, now, not just to deal with this question? What does he do now? Because remember, he's been in kind of a candidate protection program. They roll him out for fundraisers. He does the occasional right. uh, you know, brief scrum with reporters, but he hasn't submitted to significant interviews. He he hasn't been in candidate forums other than this one debate. Uh, they've been protecting him. Now it seems to me he has to prove that he yeah, can no, no, that totally. he can handle it. This is one of those moments that is the test of his campaign. He's got about a day to get his head right and then he's got to get out there. He's got to drop all the protection naked on a rock and confront this thing. And with the help of some surrogates, his friends like Clyburn, I wouldn't be surprised if the former president gets a back channel tweet to put in a good word for him overall as a partner. But he needs him in a full offense explaining who he is. And his staff has to tell him, Joe, this is a part where you either define to the country who you are or you're going to get defined as the out-of-touch dinosaur who still doesn't get things like states' rights, which means this campaign is going to spiral out by the end of the year. Which and, is a very real possibility because if it gets worse with Biden, yeah, this thing will go over the cliff quickly. Yeah. So as bad as his night was, Harris had a great night, and not just because of that exchange. Right from the very beginning, uh, she was very evocative about what her campaign was about. She put it very much in kitchen table terms. She talked about the three a.m. Uh, the three a.m. factor, the things that keep people up at uh, three a.m. Uh, you know, the life struggles that keep them up, that go to health care and, and to their financial security and so on. And then she had this moment uh, that, you know, clearly was rehearsed, but she pulled it off well. And, you know, in this gong show of a 10-person debate, when everybody is uh, shouting to try and get, uh, uh, try and get attention, uh, she sees the right moment and uh, really kind of commanded the stage. Let's, let's take a listen to that. Wait, part of the issue. On this issue. Okay, hey guys, you know what? America does not want to witness a food fight. They want to know how we're going to put food on their table. <laughs> and then she went on to give an, uh, an economic answer that was very, very powerful. She was, I thought, consistently good tonight. And in a way, she hasn't been... Uh, before, at least not in these kinds of settings, she, she there was a humanity, a connection uh, that uh, she she hadn't been making uh, before. And uh, you know, one debate does not make a campaign. What it does do is propel you forward. As she will get tested now uh, in ways uh, that perhaps she wouldn't have been tested before. She will get looked at more seriously. Exactly. This will clearly help her money. Um, and you know, I, you know, it, it was a, a, uh, watershed event for her, I think. 
Yeah, she'll get a look now, both for good and finance results and for bad. Her record is AG that she wasn't, you know, probably going to have before, at least for a while. So the good news is she's up at 30,000 feet. The bad news is she's now going 600 miles an hour and there's stuff to bump into. And how she handles that will be the test of her. I, I think in some ways, and I'm totally guessing here, but if this, if Biden does not improve, does not have a big inflection point, does not pass the hero's test and trial here, um, she may be the spark that took Biden down. But I'm not sure that'll get her nominated because I think one thing some Democrats are thinking tonight is, well, our risk-free, easy beat Trump candidate may not have his fastball. That's scary. But some of these other candidates, eh, there's no guaranteed general election winner here. I think there are a lot of Republicans who would love to see Kamala Harris be nominated and take her into those Trump counties where she's going to be controversial. And he, using every trick in the playbook, including the sordid ones, uh, would be comfortable running against her. So the the general risk vibe clicked up a bit. Now, we have a huge, long campaign to sort all this out. And now, you know, they're all going to be under the pressure. But uh, the power dynamic did change. And finally, I think over at Elizabeth Warren headquarters, they're barely done with the champagne from the night before. And now they got a real new competitor who's clearly with that raised hand on, uh, you know, Medicare for all is going to be in their lane. And well, that, let me ask you about that good. because this was kind of – we were talking about this on CNN. She has been all over the lot, Senator Harris has, on on this Medicare for all thing. She, uh, she famously uh, said in her first uh, CNN town hall after becoming a candidate that she did support Medicare for all, including the abolition of private insurance, which is the Sanders plan that she signed on to in the Senate the next day. And in many days subsequent to that, she cleaned it up and said uh, she's not for the elimination of private insurance. And then she got asked the question again tonight with a hand raised, and only she and Sanders raised their hand. So it looked like it looks like she flip flopped and flipped back uh, to this position. As to the thing I said earlier about scrutiny, this thing is going to get a big hard look now. And yep. uh, do you do you think this? How how much of a, as a Republican strategist, how uh, how vulnerable is a candidate uh, who takes that position? Well, I think it is it is a goldmine for the Republican Party because in the midterms, you guys did a great job of knocking our people back on their heels on pre-existing conditions. A great issue for the Democrats. Republicans didn't have an answer. And I think that was ready to go again and be a good Democratic issue in the presidential race. Now, the thing has been flipped because I think the one thing we've learned about health care policy is, well, people have a lot of complaints about the current system. They are scared of big, huge, scary changes. And this is a big, huge, and scary change. And it will not be hard for the Republicans to say to union member Democrats and, uh, you know, corporately employed white-collar workers, all right, here's their plan. Step one, burn your insurance card. Step two, you're now on Medicare. Um, and it's easy to easy to scare people with in a big, complicated mm-hmm. system. So I, I think it may be great Democratic Party politics on the left. I, I do think – there's room for some Democrat, and I think Bennett tried a little bit, but to really blow the whistle on this, you know, Amy didn't, because uh, the Repubs, I can tell you, they think they won the debate tonight because they're bolting down some of these candidates who could well get nominated into that position. The, the immigration thing, too, you know, we're we're kind of losing the heartless stuff, which is a pretty liberal Republican immigration. I'm, I'm for us losing because I think the kids in cages thing is just horrible, so un-American. But... The argument that you decriminalize walking across the border, that is another general election issue in Trump country where it would be nice from the Democrat point of view to trim him a little bit. It'll work the other way. So I I wasn't seeing Trump counties seeing messages in a general election Mm -hmm. are going to make any trouble for the president tonight. Now, they got time and room to pivot and all the stuff. They're in a primary, but somebody's got to be taken – uh, keeping an eye on the big picture, or they're going to run Alameda County and San Francisco up another percentage point and not change the Electoral College in four more years. So one of the candidates who didn't raise his hand on the Medicare for All uh, elimination of private insurance question was uh, Pete Buttigieg, the young mayor from South Bend, who seemed to me to be the the other person who benefited the most from this debate 
tonight. He was, you know, the if by if there was an age question about Biden, there was an age question about Buttigieg, and that was, um, would he look like he belonged on that stage, or would he look like Doogie Hauser, you know? <laughs> and he um, he it seemed he very much looked comfortable on the stage. I thought he gave crisp answers, and he also got if Biden knew that he was going to get the uh, the segregationist question. Buttigieg know that, knew that he was going to get the question about the recent uh, recent uh, police-involved shooting in South Bend in which uh, a, a man was killed, uh, and uh, questions arose about the staffing uh, of the South Bend Police Department and some long-term issues there. He got that question uh, tonight. Let's, let's listen to that. The police force in South Bend is now 6% black in a city that is 26% black. Why has that not improved over your two terms as mayor? Because I couldn't get it done. My community is in anguish right now because of an officer-involved shooting, a black man, Eric Logan, killed by a white officer. And I'm not allowed to take sides until the investigation comes back. The officer said he was attacked with a knife, but he didn't have his body camera on. It's a mess, and we're hurting. And I could walk you through all of the things that we have done as a community, all of the steps that we took from bias training to de-escalation, but it didn't save the life of Eric Logan. So he, there was some back and forth after that. Uh, Eric Swalwell uh, said, why don't you fire the police chief? Uh, and and uh, John Hickenlooper, who had very little attention tonight, the, for, the, go, the former governor of Colorado, former mayor of Denver, uh, tried to contrast his a record of dealing with uh, minority hiring and uh, and uh, police community relations in Denver uh, with uh, Buttigieg's. But for all of that, it seemed to me that he did as well as he could with that question. And he did what I, uh, what I thought he didn't do over the weekend when they had this very raucous town hall in South Bend. He showed real emotion. He showed empathy. He showed the kind of connection... He, he was rather stoic over the weekend, and it's not he's not someone who 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 does that particularly uh, on a regular basis. And I thought he did what he needed to do on that question tonight. Yeah, I mean, he always does well when he's talking. And what it showed me was they have a campaign that knew this was coming and they got ready for it and he executed. You know, that's something about being a younger candidate. You're willing to change and learn and improve. The older candidates and kind of that you made him a, and that you yeah I thought right. was as compelling as anything was him saying I didn't get it done you know well, the, I think, the the, the yep. in contrast with Biden who just doesn't who who never ever says I made a mistake never says I'm sorry never you know he just doesn't do it yeah nor does Bernie the old school guys think saying anything like that makes him appear weak when the truth is it's a strength move and it worked I think for Buttigieg the other lesson for their campaign is. They got him out of his silly costume with the shirt and the tie where he looks like junior management. He <laughs> didn't do bad in the suit. He, As long as he's not standing next to Bill de Blasio where it'll turn into a ventriloquism act, the two mayors, <laughs> uh, he, uh, I thought he did all right. He, His one challenge is his cerebral style, which is now, as, as you said, showing more heart, which is a huge improvement. He is best when he controls the pace of the answer. Because he kind of makes his logical thing, and this quicker rush stuff, he doesn't quite u- get to use his full tool, you know, box. He doesn't preach like Kamala can, but he's learning. The guy gets better every time, which is, I think, a promising sign about he'll continue to be a player in the campaign. Let's uh, talk about the night before. You know, the, the this is the nature of politics and the nature of this kind of strange. Situation we have on the, uh, the Democratic side now with so many candidates that you have to pack them into two nights. Um, you know, last night all the talk was about Elizabeth Warren, uh, and she stood in the middle of the stage through the weird draw. There were four top tier candidates on tonight's card. Last night she was alone, uh, yep. and uh, and she I thought took good advantage of it. She did pure message. I think we have a little bite of her clothes uh, here, but it reflects uh, the messaging that she uh, applied all night and has throughout her campaign. I am in this fight. The 
because I believe that we can make our government, we can make our economy, we can make our country work, not just for those at the top, we can make it work for everyone, and I promise you this, I will fight for you as hard as I fight for my own family. That is, yeah, that is the is, essence uh, of her campaign, man, right there. She, she has a message, and she reaches into every quadrant of the Democratic primary electorate. You know, I, I thought she was kind of lucky. She got to have her own debate. She got most of the questions. Nobody laid a glove on her, which I think was a huge strategic mistake by the Klobuchars of the world, particularly mm -hmm. Klobuchar, who mm -hmm. could have elevated herself. Uh, the only thing about Elizabeth Warren, if you watch her with the sound turned off, she has kind of a frantic energy. And, and her shot on MSNBC and occasionally a few of the others got a little tight. And her stump style, the, the camera magnifies that stuff. She needs to learn to at least force a smile once in a while. I thought it was – her intensity was a mixed uh, bag there. But all I in heard, all, I heard, she I had didn't a good see night. it. I heard on MS she had a, a, a kind of testy exchange with uh, Chris Matthews. By the time she got to CNN, she was smiling, and and um, you know I, maybe there was an intervention in between. <clears throat> I don't know, but it seems to me she got a lot out of that debate. When you're the when you're the most prominent person on the platform, and you and you emerge unscathed, and I agree with you, I don't know why a, a candidate like Klobuchar, who is clearly trying to grab the mantle of the center left candidate, the the, the 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 more moderate candidate, the candidate who uh, you know is a pragmatic progressive, why she didn't do at least a, a little bit more overt contrast uh, with Warren. I don't know whether she was afraid of that contrast, but for whatever yeah. reason, neither she nor anyone else uh, touched her. Yeah, she has to learn to have a little strategic courage and take a risk. I think she is so risk adverse. She's losing her one window to get elevated, and I, I think she and a few of the others are looking at that second quarter finance report that ends at the end of June, and they, they need to raise some money or they're going to wind up in Palentiville by the end of the summer out of cash, and she really needed a moment, and she didn't get it. Um, and it just – it was a performance failure on one level, but it was a strategic level. You got to go in there with some idea if you're one of these niche candidates. I think she did. But, herself. Mike, I think she did. I think she – and she she got off some good lines. She, uh, she, 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 you know, she said, I'm not one of these people who, who promises stuff I can't deliver. She, right. she had these lines, but they were so oblique that it wasn't entirely clear who she was talking about or what she was – uh, what she was saying, I, I think she had a passable night. She 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 probably felt good about parts of it, just didn't advance her message. The other guy who I thought had a uh, a good night was uh, uh, Cory Booker. There there, there yeah. were there was another standout. I want to talk about that last, but Cory Booker, very strong performance. I think we have uh, a little bit uh, of a clip from him as well. I think I'm the only one, I hope I'm the only one on this panel here that had seven people shot in their neighborhood just last week. Someone I knew, Shahad Smith, was killed with an assault rifle at the top of my block last year. For millions of Americans, this is not a policy issue. This is an urgency. And for those who have not been directly affected, they're tired of living in a country where their kids go to school to learn about reading, writing, and arithmetic, and how to deal with an active shooter in their school. Which is a powerful yeah. moment. Powerful moment. He, he's a good communicator, and I'm waiting for the DNC to clear the ham and eggers out. I don't really need to hear any more from the congressman with the pumpkin tie or the uh, the guru, uh, Williamson, and get – get Corey and Kamala and Biden all on the same stage. And, you know, it's funny. Yeah. The one candidate we haven't mentioned because it was such a replay of the oldies is Bernie. He yeah. looked old. He had the same old message. And he just seems to me like – He's kind of escrowed into a corner with his his small shrinking chunk of the vote, and he's just not driving the conversation anymore. I'm not even Ask sure it was Biden. Bernie. I think it may have been a hologram uh, from <laughs> from previous debate appearances. The, he's been exactly. saying. I think he suffers from having, even though he's influenced some of the thinking within the Democratic Party, he suffers from having been around so long that uh, all the lines sound tinny and familiar. Uh, but right. um, but the the real action uh, on uh, on Wednesday night was uh, unsuspected and it was uh, Julian Castro the, the the former mayor of San Antonio former secretary of, of HUD uh, 
and he kind of cold cocked Beto O'Rourke. Let's let's listen to that. The reason that they're separating these little children from their families is that they're using Section 1325 of that act, which criminalizes coming across the border, to incarcerate the, pre- the parents and then separate them. Some of us on this stage have called to end that section, to terminate it. Some, like Congressman O'Rourke, have not. And I want to challenge all of the candidates exactly. to do that. And, and, yeah, welcome you know, to the big time, Beto. <laughs> yeah, and O'Rourke, you know, uh, O'Rourke to... uh, responded uh, kind of weakly that he was, he, you know, he was concerned about uh, drug traffickers and sex traffickers. And then anticipating that, Castro came back and talked about the fact that there were other uh, other sections of the law that dealt with those issues. And, and they went back and forth, and it just never got better for Beto. And at the end of the day, um, if there was a big loser in these two days other than Biden, uh, it, would have have to, it would have to have been Beto uh, because yeah. he needed a good, strong performance. And, uh, and, and, and he just got taken out. And after that exchange, he, he was almost withdrawn, I thought, uh, yeah, in the debate. You could tell he, he felt beat. I mean, it, reminded, it reminds me of the hot pitcher from the miners who comes up to the show and chokes. It's a lot easy to be the charming guy running against Ted Cruz with low expectations in Texas than to get into the pit with all these werewolves who really want to be president. He just he doesn't have the chops, and uh, he, he just hasn't recaptured the magic. Now, you know, maybe he will down the line, but he's also on my short list of people who are potentially heading for Palentiville, where they just can't get the momentum. We to should get point the money out to, to, to those year. whose memories don't go back uh, that far. <laughs> that Tim, Tim Pawlenty was the governor of uh, uh, of Minnesota who uh, bombed out in the fall before he ever got to the Iowa caucuses in the Republican race in, what, 2012? Was that? Yeah, 2012. I believe so. Right. Yeah, 2012. I, I go, this is our uh, but, midnight uh, special edition, so I, we're both a little ragged in the old memory <laughs> 2012, but, you know, I this, think. As you well know, you know, more than anybody, it's expensive to run in the preseason now where you're putting on a big show for donors. But in Voterland, even in Iowa and New Hampshire, you're just starting to tune on. So it is quite possible to burn through all your money by Labor Day and still not have connected with the voters and not have any more money for voter contact and kind of be suffocated out of the race before you start, which is why these early debates are partially about impressing donors. And uh and what do you think? And do you think Castro did that? Do you see? Yeah. Do you think he'll get a yeah, I, a jolt in his fundraising as a result? Yeah, of I that? think he will. I think Corey will, and I think Kamala really will. I think Bernie and Beto may be a bit flat. I think Amy will be a bit flat because she doesn't have the small donors and the the smart money wants to see a big debate moment. And I think even Biden may have a little little bumpiness. I don't think they're going to close the quarter by breaking the bank. I mean, he's got enough mass to last a while, but. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> nothing works like winning. And if there's no election to win, you got at least win perception early to fuel the machine. And these debates have winners and losers. That has an impact. And, there, and, and as, you, as you suggest, this, this uh, fundraising period ends um, at the end of this week uh, on Sunday. Sunday? Uh, yeah, Monday. or maybe it's, yeah. maybe it's Monday. Sunday. Basically, end of June, and, and when those reports come it out. It ends on Sunday, midnight on Sunday, and uh, those reports will come out, and those will Huge media. be taken as a measure. One of the things that will be interesting to me is, um, especially after this debate, where I think she did do well, uh, one of the questions about Elizabeth Warren has been, um, can she raise the money? She's explicitly refusing... Uh, you know, to go the large donation route. She's not doing fundraisers. She's trying to do it all online. And uh, her first quarter numbers were pretty anemic. Yep. Uh, so uh, the question is, she's had success in, in polls. She's moving up in polling. She's created excitement. Now she's got this debate performance. Will she show a, uh, a an impressive number in this fundraiser, and it's important because she she's been burning her money at the faster rate than anyone. I right. think to good advantage, she's got more organization in Iowa and these early states than anyone. Yep. Uh, and she's hired some very good people, but it costs money to feed oh, the, those organizations. Yeah, the burn is tremendous, um, and she she cleverly kind of cheated the thing a bit because she had ten million cash in her Senate account. She was able to transfer over, so that was like her seed money. 
But at her burn rate, which has a political upside, she's got to, since she won't take the what we call the high dollar money, the larger donations, she's got to make that small dollar money thing work, which is, you know, a function of debate. So my guess is she's doing okay. But if she hadn't had that 10 million cash to jumpstart this thing, she too would be, I think, looking at a, at a tricky summer on cash flow. All right, brother. Well, I'm going to jumpstart my night of sleep here. <laughs> so uh, we will uh, we will talk next week and see. Uh, by by the time we talk, maybe we'll know uh, again. But maybe we'll know some of the numbers uh, from this fundraising yep. period, and we can chew those over. We might even again. But a really really interesting couple of it nights has been. And this uh, was, of course, the the cable. You know, noise meters are going to start now, or the noise and the meters will come, and we might even start to have some data to see how that African American supermajority is holding up for Joe Biden after three days of of coverage. And it coming. may, and it may not, and it may. Oh, I think he'll hold a bunch of it. it. I don't think it'll collapse, but I'll yeah. bet she. Uh, you know, he could lose 15, 20 percent. She may have raised her. She may have raised her her number. We should point out just as we leave, 15 million people watched the debate Wednesday night. We don't know the number from tonight. It stands to reason it's going to be higher because there were more uh, mar- marquee players in, in this debate. That's a huge number of people uh, to watch. So these were not inconsequential events. Uh, and we'll see what uh, we'll see what happens next. But uh, good to talk to my fellow hack. Uh, <laughs> Get some sleep. All right, brother. Talk to you good later. Night.